Welcome again to the Deification and Supremacy Tournament. We are here for Division 4 today, and this will close out the tournament. Uh, again, this is uh, with rulers, Buddhas, Messiahs, and Mahdis. That's the Islamic prophets. So, um, this is where we are at right now. Again, to recap, uh, Cyrus the Great and Jesus will face off to finish out Division 1. Muhammad is in the final four, and the Bab is also in the final four, although they are on uh, opposite sides of the bracket. Uh, but we are here for Division 4, so first, before I do anything, let me zoom in uh, so that I don't forget to do that when I'm filling out the bracket, and you guys can get a better picture of what is happening. Uh, so yeah, here's um, the third in the Bab came out on top in that against um, the Incan Emperors. That was a tough decision on my part, but I did go with the Bab because he does have a following into the present day. So I thought that would be more relevant. But we are here for the fourth division. Um, and I am just going to jump right into it because I uh, am going to scroll through the profiles in just a second. But these first two matchups here, just going down the line, Saeed Muhammad Abdullah versus Peter and Baba Sahab Abakabar versus Yosef Yitzchak Schneiderson, possibly. Wow. Uh, huh. So again, with these names, if I mispronounce them, I apologize. Um, but I'm afraid that will be fairly common. Um, in the final four videos, I make an effort to, you know, learn the pronunciations and go into more detail. Um, but for these division tournaments, um, uh, like I said... In the Division 3 video, I was kind of laying out uh, where I think this series is at now and where I want to take it into the future. But like I said, I'm just kind of playing it um, by ear and learning as I go. Um, I'm hoping to like redo these tournaments in 2021. Uh, I already have uh, some updates and new contenders for the Jesus tournament. Uh, for example. So I'm looking forward to redoing that one and uh, shaking up the order a little bit. I was talking about like possibly drawing them out of a hat or something like that because I've already noticed in this tournament um, like uh, the Division 1 video was just packed full of heavyweights and I feel like some of the uh, some of these later divisions are way more obscure, so... Um, I don't know, I just thought it would give the whole tournament uh, a different dynamic if I switched up the order a little bit. Right now it's chronological, but uh, it, it can be whatever. Um, you can add all kinds of elements, like I was talking about game show concept or um, like a celebrity death match kind of... Um, you know, just add different elements in that to make it a little more engaging, but right now, um, it is what it is. Uh, uh, I don't have, like, an animation department or team or anything like that, so it's, um, I'm just gonna take the, look at these guys, uh, you know, take a snapshot of them, that's what these profiles are intended to be. Um, a little basic information on their life, and then I judge it on the fly. Uh, most often, uh, especially for a lot of these guys um, now, the more obscure, and the, especially the, the Mahdi's, I'm learning about these uh, these people for the first time. But, let's start off with our first division. Um, again, Division 4, Deification and Supremacy Tournament. We have Saeed Mohammed Abdullah Hassan. And he led a 
led the dervish state in present-day Somalia in the two-decade-long resistance. So we have another rebel leader here. They seem to be fairly common, uh, especially with like the military um, tradition in a lot of these. Uh, and it's really just actually kind of um, emulating Muhammad. Uh, so just you know a limit more of the same I guess is what I was really trying to say so died aged 52 in 1920 yeah we are getting into more uh, current more modern era type uh, um, religious leaders so we're gonna see that play a role in, in this um, as well <clears throat> Uh, so, of course, he makes his pilgrimage to Mecca, um, and he memorizes the Quran completely, apparently. Um, he also claimed to be a direct descendant of the original Muhammad. So, um, in light of that, <clears throat> uh... Yeah, sometimes he's known as the Haji, Hadiz, as Said. Um, I don't know really the significance to that, especially, but he is just very revered. I don't know the significance of each one of those names. Um, I, I do recognize the name Haji and Said pops up quite a bit. Um, the British Empire referred to him as the Mad Mullah. <laughs> um, so beginning in 1920, uh, the British were attacking well-coordinated air and land attacks. Um, so his rebellion was ultimately defeated, and then he died of influenza that year as well. Uh, the exact spot of his grave is actually unknown. So, rebel leader... Um, you know, these, I don't know, not super impressed by that. We'll see what Peter has going on. So Peter is a Maitreya. This is in the Buddhist tradition. And again, the color coded, color coding is, uh, red is for Buddha. The yellow is, uh, Mahdi, Islamic prophet. Green is the Jewish Messiah. And pink is for a ruler, typically the deified ruler, or some sort of claims of supremacy. Uh, Peter is a spiritual leader, um, so he's also taught a school of esoteric Christianity. Uh, so again, this is more, you know, we're getting into like synchron synchronizing of different traditions as well. That's uh, the Baha'i in the last division was more of that. <clears throat> that, you know, obviously becomes more common as we get close, you know, in the more modern era. <clears throat> uh, people pulling from different faiths. I mean, this is common throughout history as well, though. We are just in the, you know, in another current revision of that. Uh, of course, the Roman era was another uh, era of synchronization. Uh, so he died in 1944. We have a black and white picture of him. Uh, I think probably moving forward, we're going to have actual pictures of these. We're going to, you know, it's not going to be drawings or sculptures anymore. Um, so widely known in Bulgaria. Um, made television appearances. Listed as one. One of the 100 most influential Bulgarians in history, ranked 37th out of 100. Well, 37th out of all of them, I guess, but uh, in the top 100. The most published Bulgarian author to this day. Uh, in 1932, he developed um, some a type of exercise perform to music to achieve inner balance and harmonization. So he just seems to be, um, I don't know, just uh, 
almost almost like a uh, um, like a capitalist Buddha type figure, you know, with you know going on a celebrity Buddha sort of type thing. Maybe is a better way to say it. Um, okay, so second matchup, um, we have another Buddha Maitreya. Uh, I would not have guessed, I would not have been able to guess correctly, probably based on his name. So it's kind of an obscure name to me. He died in 1956, aged 65, uh, regarded as the Bodhisattva, the Maitreya. Bodhisattva, that is the Buddhist path. He is on the path to becoming Buddha, but then he's also apparently known. The Maitreya is like the reincarnation of the Buddha, so uh, it's kind of a contradictory statement the way I understand it. Um, but this would be probably different viewpoints based on who you're talking to, I guess. Uh virtually on par with the Buddha, according to some. Considered the one prophesized to appear and teach the Dhamma after it was forgotten. His iconography is part of Navayana shrines and he is shown with a halo. So he's highly revered in these uh, communities, these areas. Um, he does state his tradition to be atheist, but they have um, these shrines, which feature him alongside the typical Buddha um, that you see. Uh, according to some, he has become a deity and is devotionally worshipped. So, again, all this very contradictory. Um, <clears throat> So 1950, so like, wow, the last six years of his life is when he began uh, his Buddhist path. Uh, so that's interesting. Like, so like the, almost the first 60 years of his life, uh, talk about uh, reinventing yourself. Um, so he organized a formal public ceremony for himself uh, the year of his death, a couple months before his death, uh, accepting the three refuges and five precepts from a Buddhist monk in, tra in the traditional manner, complete, completed his own conversion along with his wife. He then proceeded to convert some 500,000 of his supporters who were gathered around him three days after completing his final manuscript, the Buddha and his Dhamma, Abedkar died in his sleep. December 6, 1956. Hmm. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, he definitely reinvented himself uh, late in his life and uh, was, I would say, successful uh, doing that. So that's interesting case. Um, he faces off against Josef Yitzchak Schneerson. Um, died in 1950, born 1880, a Jewish messiah. Uh, claimed to be, uh, so this is Yiddish and I'm not even going to try it, in English, essence and existence of God which has placed itself in a body. Um, which is like, I guess... Basically, for him, the Messiah, equivalent with the Messiah. Return of the Messiah <clears throat> was an Orthodox rabbi. Um, so this is coming out of, yeah, Russia, or at that time, the Soviet Union, um, I guess would have been later in his life. Um, after many years of fighting to keep Orthodox Judaism alive, from within the Soviet Union, he was forced to leave. He was arrested in 1927 in Leningrad, accused of counter-revolutionary activities and sentenced to death. Um, worldwide outrage and pressure from Western governments, Red Cross, uh, forced the Soviet Union to commute the death sentence. So a big upcry over this one man 
um, uh, during well, you know, while millions were dying. Interesting little fact, you know, little nugget from history. As the Republican presidential candidate Hoover had lobbied for his release, um, followers in America begged for him to leave Russia and stay in America, uh, but he declined, saying that America was an irreligious place where even rabbis shaved off their beards. I, um, I don't know if I would call the United States irreligious. Uh, he ended up spending the last 10 years of his life in the United States. Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess he meant, um, not conservative enough, because, uh, definitely, um, definitely not irreligious in the United States. We'll have to dispute that. I object objectively. Uh... Okay, so on these matchups, we had the two Buddhas... Um, one versus and this first one I think I'm gonna go with uh, the Mahdi um, for leading the violent rebellion and then I will go I think I will have to go with this because he did um, uh, he seemed to be pretty widely influential especially among like uh, the elite and uh, uh, around the world, especially in the United States. So that seems to make sense there. And then for that same reason, I'm going to go with Yosef over Sayyid Muhammad. Um, again, Sayyid Muhammad was ultimately defeated by the British and then he died of the flu. That seems sort of, and, er, you know, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Contradictory to his Messiah claims. And yeah, like I was saying with this other Buddha guy, there's so many contradictions in uh, the claims of his followers and himself. Um, uh, so that's another reason why Yosef moves on. <clears throat> So we will move on now to the next two matchups. Rashad Khalifa versus Juhaman, Juhaman uh, Al Otaibai. Otaibi. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then we have Muhammad bin Ad Ala Al K. Wow, it's cut off here. So Minachim, Mindal Shneers. Man, these are some. These are some tongue twisters, uh, let me tell you. Uh, hopefully none of these guys make it to the final four so I don't have to say their names again. Uh, but we will see. So we begin the next two matchups with Rashad Khalifa, an Egyptian American biochemist uh, with a PhD would eventually claim to be the messenger of the covenant founding the USI United Submitters International which is an offshoot of Quranism. Uh, oh yeah so he claimed to have discovered a mathematical code in the text of the Quran um, involving the number 19. Unfortunately I don't have anything here about what that mathematical code did other than make him a messenger of the covenant. Uh, his teachings were opposed by traditionalist Muslims and he was assassinated in 1990 uh, at the age of 54. Here is his likeness, well, his actual picture. Um, he saw his role as purging the accretions that found their way into Islam via Hadith. Okay, so he preached against the Hadith, which is sort of like an oral tradition that came after the Quran. It's an addition or it's outside of the Quran uh, in, in Islam. And yeah, some people um, think it's extra. It's not canonical. 
uh, heretical even, which is what he, basically he's saying. Um, so believed that the beliefs and practices of Islam should be based on the Quran alone. Uh, so starting in 1968, he used computers to analyze the frequency of letters and words in the Quran and published his findings in the book Miracle of the Quran, Significance of the Mysterious Alphabets. Uh, and then he had a few, you know, some follow-up work here, but he was found stabbed to death uh, in a mosque which he founded. Um, so, what do they call it? The fatwa? He uh, clearly got a fatwa placed on his life, and it was successfully carried out in 1990 in Arizona. So, yeah. Uh, actually, I, there, you know, there's a history of that in Islam. Um, and he's facing off against another Mahdi. So, Juhama, Juhayman. Let's say, that's right. Uh, he was born in 1936, died age 43 in 1980. Um, so, he died. Oh, yeah. So, this guy led, uh, you know, another rebel leader, a soldier. He actually, uh, him and his army and his people and followers seized the great mosque of Mecca in Saudi Arabia, the holiest mosque in that country, uh, to protest against the monarchy in the House of Saud. His justification was that the House of Saud had lost its legitimacy through corruption and imita imitation of the West, which was his fa uh, father's, um, you know, same viewpoint. Oh, he declared his brother-in-law to be Mahdi. Okay, yeah, so I remember that. So yeah, he's like the rebel leader, and then he uh, gives the title of Mahdi to his brother. So that's some power, actually, if you're able to. You know, if you're actually appointing the messiahs of this religion, that's, to me, that's almost the power behind the throne, um, which makes sense since he was the rebel leader. Uh, oftentimes in these, you know, especially the militar militaristic societies, it's the military leader that is the power behind the throne. Um, I think that's uh, pretty pretty clear and understandable. Uh, so November 1979, the first day of the Islamic year 1400. Yeah, so again, they have their own calendar. Um, the Great Mosque of Mecca was seized by a well-organized group of 400 to 500 men un under al Otaibi's leadership. The seize lasted more than two weeks before Saudi special forces broke into the mosque. French special forces provided the tear gas, um, which prevents aggressiveness, slows, slows down breathing, and he was executed by the Saudi authorities in public in 1980 in Mecca. So that is the end of his story. And then we have um, <clears throat> the previous mentioned brother-in-law, proclaimed Mahdi, Muhammad bin Ab, let's just say Allah al Katani. Uh, so look at this. Died on the same day, so pro probably part of the same type of executions. We've already been over the siege uh, earlier. Uh, two after the two-week siege, at least three hundred were dead. Um, Okay, so his followers made a connection with his name that his father's name, or that his name was identical to, uh, and his father's name are identical to Prophet Muhammad's names and that of his father, developed a saying, his and his father's names were the same as Muhammad's and his father's, and he had come to Makkah from the north to justify their belief. 
Uh, so there you go. It doesn't take much. Just a small connection and uh, we can develop an entire religious tradition on this. Again, it was uh, during the year 1400 of their own calendar. Um, this ties with the tradition of the Mujadid, a person who appears at the turn of every century of the Islamic calendar to revive Islam, cleansing it of extraneous elements and restoring it to its pristine purity. So this is like, again, this is, uh, they are setting, they are creating the pattern. This doesn't happen by accident. They, uh, it's, it's part of the tradition, especially in a, uh, the messianic eschatological prophecy, you know, the progressive revelation, it's built in the, to the tradition. So you will have just a continuous succession of these prophets and Jesus's and second comings. It will be endless. Um, but here we go again. Uh, we have a another Jewish Messiah. Died in 1994. And this guy is an interesting case because after his death, um, even though he lived in it well into the era of video and audio recordings, um, well into the era of modern medicine. I mean, just all of the, you know, we def we're definitely in the era of verifiable, irrefutable proof. And yet, uh, since his death, um, the internal friction between messianics who openly declare he is alive and antis who accept the fact of his death. So a schism um, came out of his death within his own following uh, some who just do not accept that he died and some who do. Um, so... Um, it's his followers that claimed that he was the Messiah. His own attitude to this subject uh, are debated among his followers and researchers alike. So it's unclear if he supported it, uh, this claim or not. Russian-born American Orthodox Jewish rabbi. Yeah, and his name is uh, similar. He shares the last name with the previous uh, um Jewish Messiah out of Russia as well. He is considered one of the most influential Jewish leaders of the 20th century. Um, he took an insular Hasidic group that almost came to an end with the Holocaust and transformed it into one of the most influential mo movements in religious world of uh, Jewry. With, in, with an international network of over 3,000 educational and social centers. Institutions he established include kindergartens, schools, drug rehabilitation centers, care homes for the disabled, and synagogues. He is known for his intelligence and strong memory. Many testimonies attribute the performance of miracles to Sneerson. Yeah, that's another sort of common thing, like these wild claims. And yeah, I mean, you never know who or how much of it is uh, exaggeration. There are people with um, some surprising abilities uh, that are not, I mean, that doesn't make them supernatural by any means. Uh, but again, this is what happens. Um and he is facing off against, we have finally, uh, so we had kind of gotten away from the deified rulers for a little while, for a few centuries, but here they are again and with a bang. And this is Kim Il-sung. So he is the original um, uh, North Korean leader, the founder. Uh, he, um, again, um, you know, founded it as a communist leader that came out of uh, his political and economic relations with the Soviet Union. Um, I have a little bit of history here from the 
60s to 70s, North Korea actually had a higher standard of living than the South um, because they were suffering from, uh, you know, political turmoil at that time uh, in the South. But the situation reversed in the 80s, um, and that coincided with the collapse of the Soviet Union as well in the late 80s. Um, so, yeah, and of course the, the South Korea became a powerhouse fueled by Japanese and American investment. Um, I threw in a couple different pictures of him. This was, was uh, closer to his death. I don't have the year here, but you can see he had a uh, growth on the back of his head and they tried to... Uh, um, well, they actually did hide this in uh, the majority of the media that he, he's uh, shown in, but this is a rare picture where it's, uh, you know, shown pretty obviously. There's only a couple pictures where you can actually see it actually, that I know of. Uh, he died in 1994, aged 82, known as the Great Leader, and uh, would establish a personality cult which dominates... Uh, politics in North Korea we're all aware of that that continues to this day and we will of course get into that uh, later in this division this is the North Korean division um, division four here for sure uh, his birthday is called the day of the Sun celebrated as a public holiday in 1998 Kim Il-sung was declared eternal president of the Republic so he is still technically the uh, officially official leader on paper of North Korea. Uh, Christopher Hitchens always called it a necrocracy. Necrocracy. That is a tongue twister of a word. Uh, <laughs> um, he's just blending like theocracy with uh, necromancy, basically. Uh, <laughs> Um, then we kind of get into the tragedy of that uh, so this is a report out of I believe a North Korean or S South Korean reporter over 30,000 people were imprisoned for completely unjust and arbitrary reasons as trivial as not printing his portrait on sufficient quality of paper um, using newspapers with his picture to wrap packages um, grain confiscation and tax collection were conducted under force, consisted of violence, beatings, threats of imprisonment. I mean, uh, it certainly doesn't stop there. Um, you know, people disappeared. Uh, so I believe executions were probably more common than that. What I have copied there is uh, leading or alluding to. Um, where are we at? In the, I don't even know where we are going here. I am, have definitely gone too far. Um, but, uh, let me finish this one and we'll just do it. Uh, so this is a Mahdi. Uh, we are definitely getting into, uh, the modern era now. Uh, so he died in 2007. So we are in the 21st century now. Um, I'm not going to try to say his whole name, so Dia, let's just say that. Uh, he is a Shia Iraqi um, militia leader called the Soldiers of Heaven. Claimed to be the hidden imam. He was dis detained twice in recent years. Known to have connections uh, with Saddam Hussein since 1993. Uh, after the invasion of Iraq, um, and the toppling of, uh, you know, Saddam Hussein's power. Um, okay, so he uh, kind of came in out of the aftermath of that is where he really began. Um, so this is a major leader of that era after the fall of uh, Saddam Hussein. 
the first Shia Imam as well as the last of the rightly guided caliphs. So he was attempting to start his own caliphate. Uh, killed during a fierce gun battle with the United States, British, and new Iraqi army forces in January 29, 2007. He was found wearing jeans, a coat, and a hat. In addition to being armed with two pistols, he was 37 years old. Um, so let's stop there before I get into these next two matchups, and I um, can already tell you I'm going to have to move, uh, review these previous ones. Uh, but I can tell you, um, I'm going to do Kim Il Sung over the Mahdi, and this guy, I, I, uh, I like his story, so I'm going to go with him over. Um, this other, this, this Mahdi guy, um, the brother-in-law, um, just because he was like more appointed to the position. I mean, I guess it was probably inevitable just because of the connection the followers made with his name, but, uh, this guy again was, I think the power behind the throne. Um... I do like how this guy mixed sort of science with the uh, um, research he did on the text, uh, but I I do think I have to go with this guy for actually seizing the holiest mosque in Saudi Arabia, because um, that um, that's no small task. For sure. Hopefully you agree with that. Let me know in the comments if you do. If you have a dissenting opinion. Again, that is always welcome. Um, any insights or further information that you have on these people is, uh, is great. It's a great addition. Um, because like I said, I am just kind of getting a snapshot of uh, their profiles. I think I talked about this in the last division. But we're just getting this quick little snapshot and then um, just judging on the fly. Uh, so of course the next matchup here we have Kim Jong-il. Um, he is the second leader in line after his father uh, from North Korea also known as the Supreme Leader, but uh, he is not technically the president on paper because his father has that title indefinitely. Uh, he died in 2011 um, at age 70. According to Human Rights Watch in 2004, um, the government North Korean government under Kim is among the world's most repressive governments um, that would be at that time, having up to 200,000 political prisoners, according to U.S. and South Korean officials. No freedom of the press or religion, political opposition or equal education. Virtually every aspect of political, social, and economic life is controlled by the government. Um, and again, I'm going to bring up Christopher Hitchens because he actually... Uh, spent some time in this country, he visited him, and he gives some uh, pretty uh, eye-opening um, eyewitness accounts uh, from his time there. So I encourage you to watch that. He's a great resource. Um, and of course, there's no shortage of that either. Um, um, so don't just limit yourself to one source. Uh, his government was accused of crimes against humanity. Um, so he was in power during the famine of the 1990s in North Korea. Characterized as a dictator and accused him of human rights violations. Yeah, I think that's redundant. <laughs> uh, he is facing off of against this Fazrakman Satarov. So this is a Islamic Mahdi out of Russia, believe it or not. Um, born uh, possibly uh, 1929, around that time. 
uh, don't have a specific date, but um, as far as I know, as of this moment, he is still alive. So he is actually the first person so far in this tournament that uh, is presently still alive. Lived in seclusion since the early 2000s outside uh, the capital of the Russian province Tartarstan by the Volga River. Um, yeah, so he, perhaps you've heard of it if you look at information on like weird sects and cults uh, known in the media as the Catacomb sect um, out of Russia. So they, um, the sect is named after him. Uh, obviously, here's the, I have the name of it here, Fazrakmanis movement. Um, considered illegitimate by mainstream Russian Muslim clergy because, of course, claiming to be a prophet in uh, Islam is uh, heretical. There are no prophets after Muhammad. He is the last prophet. Um, yeah, supposed to be. In August 2012, during an investigation of attacks on Muslim clergy, Russian police found an eight-level complex of underground chambers beneath Sotorov's home in Kazan occupied by 38 adults and 27 children who lived in dugout rooms described as being like catacombs. Most of the children had never been outside, according to authorities, or outside their underground home. Um, uh, of course, that's disputed by the adult members who said they were able to play outdoors. Um, for sure, they never left the compound. Um, most of the uh, even adult members were forbidden to leave the compound. Uh, some did leave for work uh, as traders in the local marketplace. Um, one man told the media how he had defied the restrictions to find a job escaping by jumping over the gate. Um, four members were charged with cruelty against children. Um, so I think I'm just going to go ahead and finish the next two matchups so we can just go ahead and close out Division 4. So we begin with Lu Sheng Yin. Xing Yin? Mm. Uh, he is known as a living Buddha. And again, the uh, all the rest of the contenders are going to be uh, still alive. So he is aged 75 at, as far as I know, as of this time. <laughs> Disclaimer. Uh, born June 27th, 1945, commonly referred to as the Grand Master Lu by his followers, founded a new religious movement uh, teachings taken from Buddhism as well as Taoism and as I said known as the Living Buddha by his followers claims 5 million followers worldwide uh, majority from Taiwan Singapore Indonesia Malaysia and Hong Kong more than 400 local chapters of the true Buddhist school over the world he holds dual American and Taiwanese citizenship travels between the two countries yes yeah, so this this is kind of like a prosperity Buddha. I I look at I look um, at him as, and if you look online, he uh, he is always like dressed, you know, really extravagantly, and it always changes. It's like never the same hat. You can look at hundreds of pictures. Uh, just search his name, and it will just. I mean, every every picture is a different hat. It's like he didn't, he can't wear the same hat twice. Is what it seems like. I mean, I thought it was kind of funny. He's just like, like super materialistic for uh, what you would think of as a Buddha. I would have to say, and and uh, um, in Taoism as well. But nevertheless, uh, claims five million followers prior to becoming a monk. Uh, him and his uh, grand Madame Lou already had two children. Yes, yeah, so he is married. Married Buddha. I mean, 
I don't, I don't know if uh, celibacy is like a major part of it, and not, not probably not in every sect. I mean, I know it. Uh, it definitely is hinted at, encouraged, but the main thing is like no sexual misconduct, not necessarily uh, celibacy. Although I think in certain traditions it is uh, required for you know to be a monk. Uh, that's pretty common across traditions and religions, actually. Um, uh, so we have our first Buddha versus Buddha matchup. Interesting. So we have kind of a string of Buddhas here at the end. This is Raj Patel. Um, also, uh, still alive, born in 1972. 47 to 48, someone there. I don't have a specific date on his birthday. So he he denies being the Maitreya, but he is a very influential leader. Um, uh, so he uh, is actually really involved in like um, a lot of... Um, large like international organizations like the world bank world trade organizations united nations um so he do definitely does have a voice um he talks about uh global markets and food are very weird um which i do agree with to a certain extent um you definitely want to uh where are we we definitely need to localize our food source uh, a lot more so I definitely agree with that. Um, but I do see some advantages to having like an international infrastructure as well. So I don't, I'm not completely, um, uh, I see where he's coming from, but I'm not, you know, not completely in agreement with all of that or all the implications, I guess. I don't, uh, but that's kind of a side topic here. Uh, so yeah, basically he's well known worldwide, um, but he does deny the claim, uh, but he has a lot of fans. Uh, he considers himself an atheist Hindu. Uh, and then our final matchup, we are getting into the new age, uh, Buddhism messiahs. And first up is Ram Bahadur Bom Jong, aged 30, uh, born in 1990. So he's a millennial. And um, so he hails out of Nepal, uh, known as an ascetic. Um, many claim he is the new Buddha. And he is going to be um your uh sexual predator buddha believe it or not uh he does have a public quote tell the people not to call me a buddha but then um he doesn't actually push back against that much i mean i know that's a public statement but i think um well i'll get into it a little bit more here you'll see that he does embrace certain aspects of the the uh, status and celebrity that comes along with it um, he's referred to as a supreme soul and above lord buddha even followers claim his level of knowledge is above that of lord buddha S uh, he has reached self-enlightened um, even a greater form of self-enlightenment he exists, or he left the heavenly abode where the Amatab Buddha is said to reside, replete with its amenities and bliss, and, and comes to the earth for the good of the world. Well, in September 2018, Bamjan was accused of raping an 18-year-old nun repeatedly for nearly two years during a press conference organized by women's rights groups. The nun accused his wife of trying to keep the abuse hidden so as not to attract attacks on the religion. He claims the nun was in fact involved in theft and had been ejected from the monastery 
or the supporters do, not necessarily him. So uh, an investigation has been opened in 2019 after more complaints uh, from family members that four devotees had gone missing from several of Bam Jom's ashrams. So this story is still unfolding uh, for sure, uh, but we possibly have a, we have an alleged sexual predator Buddha on our hands. So the new generation of Buddhas uh, has taken a dark turn, I would say. And then we have, of course, we're going to end here on Kim Jong-un. Um, we have, of course, the continuation of the deified rulers in North Korea um, after his father's death in 2011. Um, he ascended to power, has followed the same cult of personality as his grandfather and father, known as the Marshal or Dear Respected, often in the media. He is aged 38, born in 1982, same year as uh, myself. Um, so... He has ordered the purge or execution of several North Korean officials. He is also widely believed to have ordered the 2017 assassination of his half-brother. Um, and that was to consolidate power. Of course, he can't have any competing claims uh, to the throne. Uh, so that is why he's um, a suspect uh, there. Although it's never been uh, proven, yeah, he was poisoned in Malaysia. Uh, his half-brother was, so he was actually abroad when this happened. Um, he is said to have 17 luxury palaces around North Korea, a fleet of 100 mostly European luxury cars, a private jet, and a 100-foot or 30-meter yacht. Um, Dennis Rodman describes, uh, yeah, Dennis Rodman made a trip uh, to North Korea recently described his trip to Kim Jong-un's private island like Hawaii or Ibiza but he's the only one that lives there his private jet is named Air Force Un <laughs> uh, uh, a 1.5 million dollar private jet and here is the link uh, to that story. I will put that in the description as well. Um, and this is, of course, keep in mind, uh, while his people um, live in poverty, extreme poverty, often starvation, and of course they have no freedom. And I know some will claim and say, well, that's socialism, that's communism. That's not what this is. Uh, this is a deified ruler. This is what happens when a cult runs your country. Uh, this is totalitarianism. Um, it is not left wing. It is not, uh, um, you know, a social democracy. Uh, it is not. It is more, it is more uh, far-right authoritarianism than anything else. Uh, it is a theocracy, um, or a necrocracy, as uh, Christopher Hitchens would say. Um, but, um, in his case, I think that his atrocities towards humanity do outweigh the sexual predator Buddha. Um, and then here, um, for the purposes of this tournament, uh, actually, I'm going to go on influence on this one. Uh, ooh, this is a tough one. Um, but you know what? Uh, overall, um, for the purposes of this tournament, I am going to go with Liu Sheng Yin, uh, especially with his claims to 5 million followers. Um, 
so that is what I'm going to do there. Obviously, here the the uh, supreme leader, uh, the middle Kim Jong Il of North Korea, is going to um, defeat the catacomb sect, and then this previous matchup I had already decided again to go with the North Korean leader. So this is, uh, this sets up an interesting matchup between father and son. And then we have a similar um, thing that's going to happen because, um, like I said, I do have to go with Kim Jong-un uh, over, this. so this is the Prosperity Buddha. I do have to go with Kim Jong-un over them as well. Uh, as far as overall power and influence, I mean, he's the leader of an entire country. This is still modern. They uh, possibly have uh, nuclear capabilities, uh, although the tests are sort of... Uh, mm, eh. I don't know if that's a resounding success on that part, although that benefits. That is to all of our benefit. Um, and then here, I think I will go with the first um, uh, so I'm going to go with father over son but then we have an interesting one here with uh, grandfather versus grandson and it's actually not clear but uh, so I will come back to that um, I need to finish this and take this one out but see Juhaiman versus the Schneiderson I am going to have to go back and look at these men um, okay yeah so this was the guy that took over the mosque in Saudi Arabia and he's facing off against the guy who died, but did he really die? Uh, so that is, uh, I think since this other guy ultimately failed, um, you know, facing off against the Saudi Arabian government, uh, with a small militia, I mean, he did have initial success by seizing the mosque, but in the end, he's facing, uh, like, what are they, the third largest army in the world, maybe even second in Saudi Arabia, based on oil money. Um, and this guy has that interesting story here. Oh, and that's, uh, that's interesting. So they are facing off against each other, and I wonder if these guys are related. Um, uh, would have to look into that more, but that is kind of interesting how this fourth division ended up. Um, but let's see, I'm just going to, like, we're approaching an hour here, so let's keep this under an hour, uh, and I will quickly make some decisions here. I think I will go with the first on this one and I'm kind of leaning towards Kim Jong-un on this one down here simply because uh, he uh, and I know this isn't really wasn't just because of him but he did finally get an audience with uh, America right uh, when, you know, President Trump so it's um, and I you know I don't think we've gotten any closer to peace I don't feel personally uh, because of that meeting at all uh, if anything I think it's uh, more alarming uh, than anything else to be honest because like I said this is a uh, the theocratic authoritarian government um, and I see a lot of parallels uh, potential parallels happening right now in America so that is highly alarming uh, so due to the current events 
um, aspect of this, I am going to give this to the grandson over Kim Il Sung. And for those same reasons, um, especially um, when you take into account this is a nuclear power, I will give it to Kim Jong Un again. So there you have it. We have um, our finals video matchups are now chosen. Here they are. Here's where we're at. We have Division 1 still to complete. Um, Muhammad awaits the winner out of that matchup. And then in the final four on the right side of the bracket here, we have the Bab versus Kim Jong-un. And I can make a prediction on what is going to happen there, but we will have to dig into that in the finals video. So thank you as always for joining me. Um, stay tuned for the finals video. The next tournament series will be personality cults. Um, and uh, no surprise there, I have more than a full bracket on that one. So I will have to decide what I'm going to do there. Um, uh, it's going to be a mix of all kinds of personality cults. Uh, and there is no shortage to choose from. So that final list will be available. Uh, I, you will get to see that in the Division 1 video when that comes out. Uh, but of course, I have all those profiles still to make and decisions to make uh, there. But stay tuned for that. We'll see you next time. Bye now. There's lots of other videos to watch, so join me, subscribe, like the videos you like, share the videos you love, let me know your thoughts in the comments, and as always, thank you. You are the fuel to the fire.